Now, the title of this year's Ireland's Edge, Altered States, was inspired in part by the transitional and sometimes disorientating changes that we have experienced in the last two years, but mainly, though, it was inspired by the person sitting opposite me now, <laughs> Dr. Roberta Murphy. Um, you're a psychiatrist, you're a graduate of UCT Medical School, yeah. um, you're now working in the Department of Brain Sciences in Imperial College London, and you work in a very, very interesting area of psychiatry. Um, not new exactly, but maybe renewed, um, and that is the in, in psychedelic drug therapy, and specifically on a program called Silodef2, which we'll come to later. But um, you, your trial um, was to test the potential of psilocybin in the treatment of depression. Yeah. And um, the uh, the outcome, the outcome of that we'll talk about later, but that particular drug has a lot of baggage, mainly going back to the 60s, the hippie culture of the 60s and all of that. But in fact, long before that, it was the subject of serious clinical research, something that very few people know about, um, along, along with other psychedelics, it must be said. Um, how did you find your way into it? So it was a little bit by chance, to be honest. There's um, a group of people in the psychiatric hospital I was in, and they were particularly interested in psychedelics and through a friend of a friend they invited me to come and meet the people in Imperial. Um, and it had been something that I had been very interested in when I was younger. I remember reading about David Nutt's research and various you know, publications and books about it and I'd kind of moved away from it um, and somehow I found myself circling back. Um, so it was yeah, quite random actually but sort of meant to be I think. Yes and the just tell me a little bit about how psychedelics act on the brain and why altered state an altered state of consciousness could be regarded as a interesting to a researcher as a neuroscientist or a doctor or a yeah. clinician and be therapeutic in some way yeah, I mean, I guess there's loads of different angles that you can take on psychedelics. I mean, in lots of ways, they give us insight into areas of the brain that are actually quite hard to study. You know, the part of the brain that tells you, you know, I am me, I am conscious, you know, different kinds of kind of higher level functions of the brain, you know, much more complex than how you raise your right arm or speak. Um, and then therapeutically, I guess, you can think of it as kind of a, an access to the unconscious in the way that Freud might have said dreams were. Um, and, you know, in kind of being able to connect with yourself in that kind of parts of you that you might have repressed or kept hidden or shoved down. And that can be good and bad. It can be both sort of a aspects to do with love or confidence or, you know, personal strength. Or it can also be old traumas, old wounds. But somehow it seems to deeply connect yourself back with yourself in a more authentic way. And that seems to be very therapeutically useful. But in all your training, um, in medical school and subsequent in, psych in psychiatry, yeah. you had never encountered psychedelic therapy as such. You it was had never not on the curriculum in UCD, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, all, but, but alongside all of that, there's all the, let's call it unofficial, informal or whatever use sure. of psychedelics. Yeah. And also, even further back than that, a lot of the psychedelics say psilocybin being one is a plant, is a mushroom. Yeah. And it's associated, it's called even plant medicine um, by non-medical professionals say. Yeah. And it's always been seen as, as a healing uh, plant, if you like, and therefore in the medical medicinal ar arsenal, if you like. So did you see, once, once you got established and, you know, into position, say, in, in the programme, did you, do you see yourself as any kind of, a, you know, as in a tradition of healing in plant medicine. Do you, do, does that ever, yeah. is, do you frame everything, anything in that context? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a really interesting question because there's lots of talks about kind of the, the lineage and, you know, that kind of goes before us and there's quite a questions around sort of um, that it's, um, you know, very bad to ignore these sort of traditional healing ways and the fact that there are lots of communities that have been using these for years but also that it's a danger to kind of do a cultural appropriation of these cultures and sort of, you know, to sell myself as some kind of modern Dane shaman when in fact, you know, that's not my heritage and there's quite a, a thorough and intense training that you have to do, you know, it's quite a deep process to become a shaman. So 
you know, a little bit of both. I, you know, I, I respect it, but I'm also aware that actually, you know, I have a lot to learn in that sense, you know, and, and it would be a mistake to say, you know, oh, yeah, so I'm part of this lineage because I'm not really, you know, I'm, I'm from a Western kind of tradition. Yes, although we come from a country which, you know, geologically is is is, yeah. it, is very appropriate and suitable yeah. environment for mushroom growing of all kinds. And, yeah. you know, so magic mushrooms have been, yeah. well, we obviously don't know whether they were part of a religious mm. ritual, but there seems to be, and there may yeah. well emerge to be evidence that yeah. it was part of a tradition here. But it certainly has been a tradition since the yeah. 60s or 70s, whenever, yeah. you know, whenever this psilocybin kind of yeah. uh, revolution happened in terms um, of these I suppose plant just medicine. To, to say something, you know, it's important to think that actually as, as an Irish country we have our own spirituality. I mean there's a strong lineage of Celtic spirituality and this kind of idea of Celtic codex shamanism is, is becoming quite popular. So, you know, we do have our own history, you know, to, to lean on. Well that brings us on very nicely to another there's the one, one way of looking at um, psilocybin or the plant medicines or even LSD which is a synthesized mm. uh, psychedelic is to look at it in, as it in its spiritual dimension. So there's a whole other spiritual dimension to the use of psychedelics, which is more like religion than medicine. In fact, you yeah. know. So um, does is that is is that anything that interests you? Is that anything that adds to to your practice or your understanding of what you're doing as a clinician? Yeah, I mean, I think spirituality, you know, is a big part of psychedelics, and it's a reason why. People sometimes regard it with kind of suspicion. It's a bit like you're joining kind of a cult if you if you're into psychedelics. Um, but I think actually I read you know Michael Pollan saying something, and, and I th and I you know that really resonated with me. You know that spirituality is is not just sort of a, a religion or a thing to do with God. It can just be feeling like you're connected to something, a bigger purpose, and and that could be something just that you're connected to humanity, that you're connected to these lifestyle you know life cycles, these generations, that you're connected to to Mother Earth and nature, you know, and, and that can be spirituality. I think it's sort of a a deeper meaning in a way. <clears throat> rather than kind of necessarily going to a church and, you know, um, worshipping a deity. And then at the other extreme, there is what's called recreational use yeah. of psychedelics. And that's the thing that really sparked the panic about psychedelics in the 60s and the 70s. That plus the its association with, say, the anti-war movement in the US and so on. But it was this idea of a free for all. And Timothy Leary, who came crossed the fence, if you like, to that side, more or less said it's actually incumbent on everybody to take psychedelics, that you should take psychedelics, that it's good for your mind and for your consciousness and so on. And so while all of that is happening, um, there is an underground or partially overground even now yeah. um, community that is just taking psychedelics for its own reasons in its own settings and without any rule book to speak of. Now, is that also a kind of a resource for somebody like you in the clinical setting, in that there's a whole, if you like, bed of data there about usage and that you can draw on? Or is there any connection or conduit between that world and your world? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are. I mean, sort of in the interim between sort of official psychedelic research being shut down and it getting restarted, there's been um, a lot of underground work going on and, you know, some may be kind of unregulated and there are problems that come with that, you know, people taking advantage of a position of power and, and all that kind of thing. But there's also been an extraordinary amount of learnings and actually, you know, not to condone kind of illegal activities, but in some ways they have a, a flexibility in that work that those of us in research don't have. You know, they can say, well, you know, maybe I'll add a little bit of MDMA, maybe we need another, another session. You know, we're stuck in quite rigid kind of um, rules. You know, we, don't re we can't really make any changes. Um, so, you know, it does complement the work in lots of ways. So let's talk about the work then. <laughs> so Silodep 2, the programme, just tell me a bit about that. And I presume, in fact, I think I know there was a Silodep 1 yeah. before a Silodep 2. So just talk a little bit about those two programmes in Imperial, what they came out of and, um, and where you are with, with Silodep 2 at the moment. Yeah, so Silodep 1 was um, like a phase one trial, which is sort of just establishing safety. Um, which means that they gave um, psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, um, to I think it was about 20 people, um, and they gave them one kind of medium dose and one big dose. And it was basically a way to say, like, is this safe? Is anybody coming into serious harm? And is there any 
evidence that it might be useful, and they established that with that first trial. And then the second stage in clinical research is that you do a comparator trial, which means that you compare it to a placebo or kind of a gold standard, and in our case, that's kind of a traditional antidepressant. And um, so we had kind of, I think, 50 people come in, and then they got either the antidepressant or high-dose magic mushrooms or psilocybin. And did they know before they came on the trial which they would get? No. And that was actually a really difficult part of the work, that there was 25 people who were quite happy and then 25 people who were, in some ways, did quite well a lot of the time, but, you know, there was a lot of disappointment. And were they people who had to have no experience of psychedelic use in the past or that they should have had psychedelic, they should have taken psychedelics? I think about 10% um, of them had had psychedelics before. The rule was that you could have taken psychedelics, but not for therapeutic purposes, because in our idea, I suppose, um, having psychedelics, you know, at a festival, talking to your friends, you know, in at a gig is a very different experience than what we were doing. And um, so that was kind of where we drew the line. And how did you, uh, did you, did you get oversubscribed? Did you did you screen them? What were your protocols in setting up the... Massively oversubscribed. People were, really? you know, banging down the door to get in. Um, and, you know, we had, I think when we started the trial, there was a list of like a thousand people. Um, and screening was like a massive part of the job. And actually that was kind of the, the part of the job that I took a lead on. Um, and we were only able to give people who had quite severe depression a place in the trial, because um, that was our criteria. But there, yeah, there were so many people that we turned away um, who, you know, and some people go on and they'll go to another country where it's legal or they'll take it illegally, but for some people they felt like they really wanted to do it in that kind of safe, you know, English, you know, English doctors or, you know, Irish doctors, but, you yes. know, they wanted that kind of safe feeling about it. Um, that, that brings us on to another aspect of treatment with psychedelics or use of psychedelics even, and that is the idea which is unusual, I think, for, drug t for, uh, for taking a drug in the conventional drug taking scenario, which is that where you take it, how you take it, with whom you take it, and the whole environment around the taking of the drug will to some degree determine how the drug acts upon you and you with the drug. I can't think of, of, of other drugs that are so, you know, so used or prescribed in practice. So yeah. would you explain a little bit about that whole set and setting, you know, notion in psychedelics? Sure, yeah. So I guess the idea, you could kind of almost think of it as internal and external context. So the set is kind of mindset in a way, and that can be someone's expectations, you know, how they're feeling on the day, are they extremely anxious, are they quite comfortable, and also just their kind of personality, you know, and what they carry with them, which might be, you know, in the case of our trial, a lot of trauma, you know, a lot of kind of psychological defenses, all that kind of stuff. And that kind of, in a way, kind of massively dictates the kind of experience that you have. Um, and then setting is much more around, you know, who it is that you're surrounded by. So that can be the music, which, you know, there's evidence saying that's kind of almost like the hidden therapist. It's a, it's a really important part of the research and, and the experience. Um, the room that you're in, you know, are you in a quiet sort of safe room or are you in a busy room with lots of people? Um, and then, of course, the people that you're with, which is probably the most important thing, I think. And that can be in a group setting, you know, how comfortable you feel. Um, and also the relationship with the therapist. And, th and that's actually my particular re research area of interest, is thinking about how, you know, the relationship with the therapist and also how the person taking the psychedelics, their patterns of relating and how that kind of interplays with the experience that they have. So it was one dose followed by another dose over six weeks. Yeah. So it was the second dose in the last three weeks and was it the bigger dose or how, how, how did it... Wrong. Yeah, so we did two identical doses. So mm -hmm. they had a, a preparation session and then one dosing session. And um, so that was like day two of the trial. And then there was multiple integrations over the next three weeks. Um, and then they had a second dosing session and then three further weeks um, of integration. And did all of the participants who got the psilocybin, did they stay the course? They stayed for the full six weeks. Nobody left or said it wasn't for them no. or anything like that. I think one person tried to leave and that was because they felt that they had been given the low dose and they were upset, but in fact they've been given the high dose. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, that's kind yeah. of another thing is people can, um, if they're not ready in a way yeah. to get in contact with that inner material, then, you know, you can have somebody on a really high dose of psychedelics sitting there saying, I'm fine, I don't feel anything, right. which is remarkable. It is remarkable, <laughs> it is truly remarkable. Yeah. Um, 
So assuming that the 1,000 that actually wanted it and all of the people who were disappointed because they didn't get on it, that would then suggest that they were very well disposed to take the, yeah. the, the treatment and that they'd chosen it and not only that, but they'd volunteered and moreover they were disappointed. So that would narrow the range of maybe subject that you had in the trial or, or would yeah. it? In yeah. other words, you were unlikely to get a patient or a person or a participant so anxious that they would actually have a terrible time because they were so keyed up and looking forward to this and anticipating it. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I mean, we did have people who had very difficult times and I guess that's kind of the idea that in a therapeutic context, a bad trip can be very useful in a way that can mean get in contact with existential anxieties or you know your deepest darkest depressions uh, and that can look like a bad outcome or that you know something's gone wrong but actually you know what's really important in psychedelic therapy is to think that that is the work you know that is kind of the right path for that person and kind of what they need to be working with and it's the same that happens in therapy you know sometimes um, a healing journey can, can look like a very painful journey you know. So they presumably were told, you know, that these discussions were had before they ever took this. So yeah. they would they would know that what they were undertaking. I mean, in theory, anyway. I mean, it's all very well to say I'll sign up for something very difficult, and then it's yeah. it's kind of horrendous at the beginning. But as you say, gets better at the end. So in terms of psychedelics application, say across the board, the the, the person taking it would need to be. A certain kind of person in other words one who accepts that they want to go on the journey even though they understand that there are that that, that there could be very dark parts to this journey as opposed yeah. to somebody who said don't give me any of that talk i just want something to make the pain go away which is more of a symptomatic approach and and that seems to be like what psychiatry has done for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in psychiatry, it's so much just about, um, you know, numbing or cutting off or sort of, you know, these kind of symptoms are bad. And, and sometimes actually your, you know, mental health issues are important markers of something about you and for you. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's kind of what's really beautiful about psychedelics is a way you kind of use your your pain as a teacher, you know, as, as to guide you. You know, our clinical director, Roz Watts, would always talk about that, kind of using your pain as a navigation system. Um, and yeah, you absolutely have to be signed up for that journey. And sometimes I think you can't quite imagine what it's, how bad it's going to be or how difficult it's going to be. But lots of them will say, you know, I've been living with this depression for 20 years. I'll do anything. You know, I'll drag myself over the coals if I can feel better at the other side. That, that's very interesting because one of the very well documented trials is the one that um, took place in NYU under Dr. Stephen Ross with end of life mm -hmm. um, participants who were experiencing in addition to being terminally ill and all that that brings um, absolutely debilitating anxiety and terror about death. And the outcomes for that were quite extraordinary. Mm. But interestingly, so much so that when they went to get the second stage to the FDA in America, the FDA said, your data is so interesting, your outcomes are so, you know, m mind blowing, really, that we would like you to extend this had never happened before. Apparently, they extend the range of your research to include people with depression, mm. because so many people suffer from depression. Um, and then uh, and that, that, that's, that's, that's also very interesting. And also earlier in the 40s, there had been other trials that had very, not trials, actually full treatment programs mm. that had very out, good outcomes with addicts and alcoholics. So given that, that this is now where we are and that, that, that there's an, a wider acceptance, I mean, if the FDA with all its you know, metrics and criteria and regulatory yeah. oversight and all the rest of it accepts all of that, it looks like a new age of a kind, but maybe one not to get massively excited about. Yeah. But on the other hand, at the moment it's a Schedule 1 drug, you act under licence. How is this to get to the next stage where it's actually embodied in treatments that would be offered to people who just go to their psychiatrist or doctor with depression? Yeah, I mean, as you said, there's a massive amount of hype and interest around psychedelics at the moment. Um, and in some ways, I think, you know, as you said exactly, you know, we need to be very grounded and measured and kind of not um, get too far ahead of ourselves. 
Um, because although, you know, there are some critics who will say that actually the the hype is, is way beyond what the research has shown and, and so there, there are good findings and of course there's a massive history of traditional and underground use. Actually the research is all very early, you know, and um, small numbers and small outcomes and um, we're still very far away yet from reaching a point where it might be legalised and um, so I think we need to be very measured and also very careful and in a way, you know, just to speak back to something that you said earlier, that's why we were so careful with who we included in the trial, because I think it's best to kind of, you know, go cautiously to begin. Um, so I guess what will look like continuation is, is sort of just bigger trials. You know, there's kind of multiple stages. There's quite a clear sort of protocol that you follow in terms of bringing something. Um, and I suppose that links a little bit to the idea, you know, of big pharma coming in, commercialization mm -hmm. and... Um, in a way, they probably have the money to do that, but of course, that's quite a contentious area. Um, I mean, that's another form of appropriation, if you, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to, to think you're in a tradition of, say, traditional healers in plant medicine, but it's quite another thing to synthesize uh, psilocybin and yeah. commercialize it and, and, and actually cut it off from, from the healer aspect. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> also, I, I was just struck by um, some of the material I read about um, Silodep 1 in particular, that some of the participants had six months of a very good depression-free run, and, then, and some were still actually having the benefits of that, but a good half of them had, uh, I don't know whether you'd say relapse, but their, their depression returned. So that would suggest that they need maybe um, that, that it's not a one dose fix for anything, that it's um, a continuous course of treatment. But that can't happen because they were volunteers on a, on a specific trial that ended. And then they're out there and they know that it works and they can't have it again. I mean, that, that's a terrible position to be in, isn't it? Yeah, and that's something that we really had to think about, you know, the fact that in a way, you know, we would bring people into this particular kind of paradigm and, and way of healing, but they would be kind of delivered back to kind of quite traditional psychiatric services. I think what you said was, was correct, though, that it's, you know, and there's a little bit of a kind of an idea that it's kind of a magic bullet, psychedelics, that, you know, you kind of um, wave a magic wand and, your, your, you know, your issues will be gone. Um, but actually, it's a really long, you know, slow, monotonous journey at times, you know, that in a way, you know, you can take psychedelics and you can be integrating those experiences for years. Um, and, you know, I think that's sort of something really important for everybody to keep in mind, because actually it can be quite damaging when people come and they have these massive expectations and they sort of, you know, we would all the time be trying to really, you know, tempering the expectations of people coming in, because then when you a few months later start to feel bad again or your depression starts to creep in, you know, it's almost like a whole double layer of, of re-traumatization that you say, you know, I finally did this thing and it was supposed to be the kind of the end of it for me. And so it's really important that people understand that it's um, it's a catalyst to healing and opens a door to something, um, but it is not going to heal you in of itself. There might be the rare people who take one psychedelic and, you know, it changes their life and, and it can set you on a journey in a way, but um, I think, you know, it opens a door and you see things, but you have to work very hard to kind of, you know, keep working with those things, integrating those things on kind of a day by day basis. Yeah, it's interesting that you use that door metaphor, which is the one that Aldous Huxley used, yeah. speaking of which or whom uh, took a dose, I think of LSD, I'm not sure, but on, on the day that he died, he, yeah. he, he died um, and his wife had administered Laura, a dose yeah. of LSD. But if you could ma wave a, 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 a wand and say, um, make it available to one sector, say, wh what would you pick if, you, if it could be done tomorrow? I was in which, oh God, I couldn't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, in a way, I suppose depression is probably the most prevalent. So you could say that might help the most people. Um, and there's the most evidence of that. But then... I also feel so strongly for the people in palliative care, you know, I, I think to give people peace at the end of their life, you know, to, to leave this earth feeling okay and connected and safe is is something quite extraordinary. Um, so, I, yeah, I couldn't answer that, you know, really. And do, do you think we're 
that it's imminent that we're looking at, given the, given the way things have, say, moved in the States with decriminalisation mm -hmm. and even legalisation, in fact, not even decriminalisation, legalisation of, say, marijuana, something like that. Do you think yeah. that there's an, another barrier with psychedelics that has to be passed? Well, there's lots of kind of, uh, obviously, as you know, psychedelics come with a lot of baggage in a way, I suppose. I mean, I would say you can have a pretty awful time on marijuana and you can get quite paranoid and actually, you know, if you look at the, the evidence, there's much more harm from marijuana than from psychedelics. Um, but obviously when psychedelics go wrong, they're such a powerful tool, you know, they go really wrong. I mean, that's um, the extremely rare and unusual cases of people who, you know, have long-term psychosis or mania or, you know, jump off a cliff or whatever, which is, you know, extremely rare, but, but quite bad if it happens. Um, people argue that we shouldn't be moving specifically towards medicalization because that's a very narrow use of psychedelics and that we should try and get just sort of full legalization, which you can see is happening in some places in America. Um, so, so I don't know really, but I think the, the big pharma, they're probably kind of leading the way and, and they're probably going to dictate what happens and when. Okay, we look out for that. <laughs> thank you, Roberta. Thank Great, you thank much. you.